Hello, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother, and welcome to uh, the next Mother Room uh, session that we have. And I have got a special guest with me today who has written um, two tie-ins for the Alien Universe. One's a short story and one's a self-contained novel for Alien Isolation. I really hope I don't mess up his name, <laughs> but it is King DeCandido. <laughs> You got it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did mess it up off off um when we were uh not streaming before and he corrected me, so let's hope I remember it for the rest of the interview. <laughs> <laughs> sure, so, so Keith, how are you going today? How has life been? Uh life's been insane, but you know, uh same as it has been for everyone. Um I live in New York City, which has been one of the hardest hit by the by the pandemic. But um, we've been staying in and trying to stay safe and going out as little as possible and not actually interacting with other humans very much. So um, um, it, it's been interesting, actually. I mean, when, it, when, when the lockdown first started, uh, it was pretty chaotic, but things settled fairly quickly into, into almost a routine, you know, for things like shopping and, and, and dealing with stuff. Um, in, in such a way that everybody like, you know, kept their distance from each other and, and was able to stay as safe as possible. So. Oh, that's good. Um, luckily my, my wife and I both work from home. So um, professionally things aren't very much different. <laughs> um, the, the, the only issue of the only issue for me, as far as that goes, uh, my writing hasn't changed. I'm still doing all the same writing I've been doing all along. Uh, I still have novel contracts. I still have the regular writing I do for tour.com. Um, I write about pop culture for them and, um, and the writing on my Patreon and, and other stuff that's still completely the same. Uh, what's different is, uh, the martial arts teaching I do. I teach karate to kids. I teach a couple of after school programs. Those went on hold in March and, um, and I have no idea when they're going to start back up again. Um, so, and I miss that. I, I partly part part of it's financial. I miss the income from it, obviously. But the the, the thing I miss most because we're everything else is okay financially speaking. We're we're actually doing okay. Um, it's the um, I miss the kids. I miss teaching the kids. I miss working with them. It's it's fun and I enjoy it a lot. Oh, cool! That's awesome. My my dad used to teach taekwondo, so I learned when I was like really young. But then I punched mm -hmm. my brother one time really hard. <laughs> And then my dad stopped teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well. uh, sibling rivalry, what can you do? Yeah, exactly. Um, on, on the topic of sibling rivalry, because I, I have to cover this for my friend Tara or she'll kill me, uh, what, what was it like writing for Supernatural? It was fun. I, uh, I wrote three of the first four Supernatural novels that were published uh, starting back in 2007. Uh, when I wrote Nevermore. Uh, and then I did another one. I did, I did the first one, Nevermore. Uh, and then the third one, which was called Bone Key. And the fourth one, which was called Heart of the Dragon. Uh, I did those, those three um, novels. And, and it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, the, the, um, what was interesting was actually that um, because of the timing of Bone Key, um, I wound up, it wound up actually apparently being actually read by Eric Kripke himself. See, normally when you write a work of tie-in fiction, like an alien book or a supernatural book or a Star Trek book or a Star Wars book, there is somebody in the licensing department who has to approve everything. Um, very rarely do the people actually involved in the production of the show or the movie, uh, get involved in approving the tie-in fiction just because they don't have time. You know, they're too busy producing TV shows and producing movies. You know, they, they, they don't have time to do that. Um, so it's left to somebody in licensing whose job it is to, to do that sort of thing. And a lot of times you get people who know that really well. Just as an example, um, the person who does the approval for Star Trek uh, fiction and comic books is a guy named John Van Sitters, who works at CBS Licensing and who is a huge Star Trek fan and also has a very good sense of story and such. So he's, he's great to work with. Um, and it was somebody at Warner Brothers initially when, when I did my first Supernatural novel. My second Supernatural novel, I happened to turn it in right in the middle of the writer's strike in 2007. And uh, so Eric 
Kripke normally would be too busy being the executive producer and showrunner of Supernatural to actually read my book, but there was a strike on. So he literally had nothing better to do. So, um, so no pressure. Like, and then after, after that, um, his office, at least initially, did the approvals. I don't know if that continued after, after he stopped being showrunner. I wasn't, I wasn't writing for the series at that point. Um, but uh, the, um, I, it was his office that started doing it afterwards instead of the licensing department, uh, which, which I thought was actually kind of cool. Um, ah. But that, that, that happens occasionally. Um, and, it, and it's more common now than it used to be where the, the people involved in running the show will actually be interested in the tie-in books. Um, they're not always. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I can't imagine Ridley Scott giving the horse's patoot about most of the alien novels, just as an example. I don't know one way or the other. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but like I wrote a, I wrote a leverage novel uh, back in 2014. Um, and John Rogers, the co-creator of, of Leverage, uh, was involved in the in the approvals of that. But John is also used to write comic books. He's he, he knows that he knows that end of the business fairly well. Um, I did a Heroes Reborn uh, novella. Oh yeah, uh, in 20, 2015, I think. Um, and that when when they revived Heroes for that that fourteen episode miniseries, they did, and that. We worked very closely with the showrunner of that, the guy, the second, the person who was right under Tim Crane, uh, and they kept us very much in the loop on everything. They were, they were very dedicated to making the, the, we did six novellas all together, to making sure those novellas tied in directly to the TV show, which was great. It was, oh, it was that's wonderful. really good, because usually, yeah. like, you get people who are like, yeah, just touch on these story points, and that's fine. <laughs> just avoid yeah. this thing, and it's all good. And well, it's tough, especially when something's ongoing, because you know you could come up with something and then they contradict it later, and there's no way to, you know, uh, yeah, which happens a lot. But, yeah. uh, but some, but it's it's nice when they actually care enough, you know, even if it's little things like, so, and it, sometimes you'll come up with something that that um, you can't do because they've already got something else planned for it that you couldn't possibly have known. I did uh, the one and only novel based on Sleepy Hollow, the TV show with. Uh, Tom Mason and Nicole Bahari that ran. Oh, in the okay, yeah, and, I remember that uh, one. Yeah, and um, I pitched uh, my initial plot that I pitched to them involves. Uh, I actually tied together actual American Revolutionary War history to my magic plot the same way the show did all the time. Um, specifically, there were a series of swords, magic swords that were well, they weren't magic in real life. In real life, they were just these elegant swords that were given to several heroes of the revolution. Uh, mm. And one of them's on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York City. That's how I found out about it. And I pitched that, the idea that those elegant swords also, like the etchings that were on it that made it look pretty, were actually runes that could cast a magic spell. And so I pitched that to them and they said, great, we love it, wonderful idea. It can't be a sword. Turns out in the second season they were doing a magic sword story, so I couldn't, you know, I, they didn't want to. They didn't want to repeat that, so I, I made it something else. I made it a, a little like a cross. It was a sort of a metal that had you know, oh, something, something completely made like, up. It's really familiar. Yeah, yeah. that's why. Oh, jeez. Uh, yes, they did a magic sword story in the second season, so I couldn't do it. Uh, Damn. Yeah. Does it ever happen often that you would make a pitch and they're like, "Yeah, we're already doing that." Oh yeah, happens all the time. Which, and in some ways, it's it's a good thing because it means you're on the same wavelength as the people producing it. So that means you're you're thinking the right way to write a story in it. Yeah, mm, yeah, that's true. Now, yeah. um, uh, with Alien Isolation, how did you yes. end up uh, signing on to to that um, like tie-in? Because it's it's pretty daunting. It's tied into a game. It's tied into comics. It's tied into a mobile game. Like there's so much lore and stuff that comes with yeah. this game, which is, it was pretty in depth for its time, and and people are still discovering stuff. Um, did did you have any idea what you were getting into when you signed up for it? <laughs> uh, more or less. The the what happened was well, I did the story for Bug Hunt, which was the anthology that came out in 2017. Um, 
And that that kind of was my my audition to write write alien fiction. And um, and then I was uh, working with Steve Saffel on a story, uh, which we were gonna we're all set to pitch to 20th Century Fox, and then Fox came back and said, "Yeah, no, we don't want to do that. We want to do we want to do an adaptation of Isolation." And they already had me set to go to write a book, so I was like, "Okay, fine, we'll just do that." Um, the but it was part of a concerted effort because 2019 was the 40th anniversary of of the franchise. Mm. They were doing a bunch of different things. That was, I mean, Isolation was part of the whole Amanda Ripley thing they were doing yeah. uh, last year with with the mobile game and uh, the web series that adapted the game and uh, and the comic book uh, from Dark Horse. So, um, was it Resistance or? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Resistance. I, I too many one-word titles that all sound the same. Um, but yeah. the, the four-issue <laughs> miniseries that has Amanda and Zula Hendricks, um, uh, who, who I love, by the way. Zula Zula is such a wonderful character. I I was so glad I was able to work her into isolation, however briefly. Um, in much the same way Amanda was worked briefly into the miniseries that introduced Zula. So, um, uh, the, and, and I'm, I'm envious of Tim Wagner for getting to write an entire Zula novel. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, do you get to talk she, to many other, I mean, I, I'm sorry. Did you get to talk to many other, um, alien authors? Like, I guess you guys get to meet up at conventions and stuff. Usually well, some of them I already know, like I've known Tim for years, just as an example. Um, uh, Scott Sigler and I have been on panels together at Dragon Con. Um, you know, a, a bunch. Uh, I, for that matter, Steve Saffel, who's the editor of Titan. I've known Steve for t- at least 25 years now, from back when he was working at Marvel. Um, and I was an editor for Byron Price. Um, and, wow. And we, you know, we, we yeah, this is uh, the hilarious thing is we've known each other for 25 years. This is the first time we've met. I, uh, I, well, Bug hunt, really, but isolation in particular was the first time we really worked together. Um, <laughs> it just, you know, worked out that way. Um, you know, so uh, a lot of us all know each other anyway. Um, you know, uh, from 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 conventions, from from various other places. So um, and uh, so yeah, I was I was, and I was in touch with Brian Wood, uh, who wrote the comics. I, I sort of you know. Oh yeah. I was, so- He's so you got to, Zula. yeah. So you, did he give like feedback on how Zula should be uh, out or anything like that? Um, well, I sent him the bits with Zula in it, and he said they were fine. So <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> he didn't give he didn't give any specific feedback. So I guess I got it. I got it right. Yeah. Um, but uh, which is good. Um, and uh, so yeah, there's there's lots of communication going on uh, generally. Um, you know, we we we. we you, you, you try to you know, be consistent with each other. It's, it's, um, you know, th- this is a whole area that is pretty open. Yeah. Um, the period between alien and aliens, uh, you know, there it's, it's fun to play around in it, but there's also not a lot to go on from the movies themselves. So it gives you a certain amount of freedom, um, to play with it. So. Yeah. Is there anything that you introduced into, the book that it's kind of like a signature thing of yours that you do in other books? Um, well, in general, one of the things I try to do, uh, and, and I, I, I don't always get the opportunity to do it, but is how, what life, what everyday life is for someone who lives in these fantastical worlds that we play in, whether it's, you know, a high fantasy setting or, you know, modern Seattle, but there are vampires or, you know, what, what daily life is like in Metropolis or Gotham city or, or something like that. Um, how, how it affects everyday life. You know, the, the, the regular person who gets up and goes to work in the morning, um, and, uh, has to deal with various mundane concerns in a world where there's magic or where there's aliens or where there's, mythical creatures or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, Alien in particular is very well suited to that because from the very beginning, Alien was about lower middle class people, basically, which are the types of people who you never see in dramatic fiction. Um, In fact, one of the things that that is, to me at least, is is mildly disappointing about Prometheus and Covenant 
is that they're about, you know, big, important events for big, important people. And I'm much more interested in, you know, the guy who lives in the apartment next door and the, the woman who lives down the street and runs the store or something, you know. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that particularly appealed to me about, all, honestly, all four of the first batch of Alien movies uh, is that they all focus on you know, marginalized people or, or a subculture of people or, or just people who don't normally get to have stories told about them, whether it's, mm. you know, the, you know, the, the, the space longshoremen of, of alien or, you know, the Marines of, of aliens or the prisoners of alien three, or, you know, the, the, mercenaries of, it, of resurrection and that's that that appeals to me in particular and that's something i tried really hard to do in isolation particularly um the flashbacks to amanda's childhood and uh adolescence that i yeah. did throughout you uh, painted a very the- amazing like vivid picture of what it was like for her to live um at that time uh and and also like being able to like only travel to a certain train station, only having enough credit to go there. Like I've been there, man. And for you to be yeah. able to put that into a sci-fi book, I was like, wow, this guy gets me. <laughs> I, in general, and, and this is, you know, something else that I try to put into my fiction, you almost never see, especially in heroic dramatic fiction, how people pay for stuff, you know? I mean, yeah, sure, mon- sure. money never like Batman, comes okay, up, Batman, really. <laughs> Batman's independently wealthy, so we get that. But, you know, uh, and, and it's one of the things that always appealed to me, for example, about Spider-Man as a superhero, because he, he's always dealing with money issues, which, which I always <laughs> liked, because um, that, that just felt more real to me. Um, you know, how do you, how, do you, how do you make your money? How do you pay for things? How do you feed, clothe, and house yourself? Um, Mm -hmm. it's all well and good to go off on a heroic quest, but you got to pay for the food, you know, um, stuff like that. And and that's, that's something that, that's what interests me as a writer and as a reader for that matter. Um, and that's, so that's something I tried very hard to work into. And I thought, like I said, Alien is particularly well suited to that. I mean, the very first conversation we see in the first movie is, is the two lowest paid guys on the ship bitching about how much they're getting paid. You know? Yeah. (laughs) I think and, uh, that um, uh, you were really great at um, making uh, Carter the most hateable guy. Like he's he he's given like so much. Like he he basically lives, you know, rent free in in an apartment, and he always complains about paying for everything. But he I don't think he actually does anything. He just drinks. And, and, you know, disappoints his daughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, how, how did you, uh, like, think up a character like that? Because I always wondered what sort of um, role models Amanda would have had to, to turn out the way that she did. I, I he, I mean, the name, the, the character's name came from Fox. That was already established as her stepfather's name. Um, but they didn't really do much. Uh, with who he was, um, I just I figured it would work. It would it would make for a more interesting story if he was some, you know one of those people who thinks he's smarter than everybody else, but doesn't actually put in the work, um, and just assumes that everybody around him is an idiot. Therefore, he doesn't have to deal with any of them, but doesn't actually take responsibility for any of it. I know way too many people like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and it's it's and it's it's the type of yeah again it's it's a type of person that you don't always see in dramatic fiction um, because it's not a particularly pleasant person who isn't you know an evil bad guy or anything he's just a jackass who's you know trying and failing to get through life yeah yeah um, is there anything that you wanted to put into either of the stories like deep background or um alien isolation that you couldn't like it was an idea and they're like no you can't do that no not really um they were they were pretty cool about everything i threw in there um i can't think of any and i mean there there were there were um i had to to retrofit some stuff because um 
uh, in order to coordinate with the web series because the web series actually established some stuff that wasn't part of the original game script, which was that um, Waylon Dutani um, helped financially and in other ways with Amanda's upbringing, which I had not been told <laughs> initially. Um, when I, when I was first, when I did the first draft of the manuscript, so when I, when I did the revisions of the manuscript, I had to incorporate that into it. So did you get to uh, watch the digital series before everyone else? Uh, I, I saw the script. Uh, the, the script was available. Um, oh, okay. Um, I didn't. I didn't see the final product until everybody else did. Uh, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I knew what they were doing in it. Um, oh, okay. Were, yeah. Uh, Fox and Titan and. Uh, I think it was IGN who did the web series and Dark Horse for that matter. We're all trying to like coordinate with each other and make sure that uh, everything fit decently. Yeah, um, that's a pretty big so, task. Yeah, so I had, and, and I also I also changed uh, the ending of the book to match what was in because uh, the web the web series is basically an, an extended flashback of her while she's floating around um, in space. Yeah. Because at the end of the game, she's floating around in space, and we That's leave her. black, yeah. <laughs> Which I thought was unimaginably cruel, but then again, that whole game is unimaginably cruel. <laughs> um, and uh, the 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 web series they did had, you know, the framing sequence was her floating around and, and recording the story of what happened to her. Uh, so I I, I, re I had to redo the ending of the book to match that. Um, which was fine, you know, that's, that's part of the are you allowed to disclose the original ending that you had for her? It was just, it was just, um, it was originally her working her way back onto uh, the Torrens uh, and, and, and on her own uh, instead of uh, finding a, a signal. Um, uh. I mean, the, the, the gist of the ending was the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was just it was just the details of what precisely happened to her while she was floating around in space that was different and better and better that it matched the other you know that the, they both match each other than contradict each other i've i've been in situations where where my i have written several movie novelizations over the years including the first three resident evil films and it's it's always fascinating when you do a movie novelization how much cooperation you get from the studio and it varies from film to film. And in this case, from film to film within the same franchise. Um, for Resident Evil Apocalypse, they gave me whatever version of the script happened to be most current when I got the contract. I didn't find out until I saw the movie in theaters that they changed the ending. <laughs> Nobody bothered to fill me in on that. Uh, and they approved it anyway? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and it's, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, sometimes they let you know when they make changes, sometimes they don't. Um, and, but then the next film, uh, Extinction, they were incredibly cooperative and were, filling, were not only keeping me up on all the changes, but they encouraged me to expand on it. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff in my novelization of Resident Evil Extinction that's not in the movie, uh, but that fleshes out both, both bridging the gap between Apocalypse and Extinction. Uh, because the apocalypse ended with seemingly the threat neutralized and Raccoon City destroyed and everything was fine. And then Extinction opens and it's the zombie apocalypse. So <laughs> they encouraged me to backfill that to say how they got. And there was also one character, the actor wasn't available to appear in the movie, but they wanted to keep the character around for future films. So they told me to just give her a subplot, send her off somewhere and give her something to do so we know what she's doing. So I, I did a whole story for Jill Valentine, uh, which was fun. Uh, so that was great. So it was like, it was a study in contrast. It's the same studio, same movie series, but for one movie, they were completely disinterested in what I was doing. <laughs> uh, and then, and then for the next one, they were like incredibly solicitous of what I was doing. The funny thing is in the extinction novelization, I got to rewrite the ending, like use the actual ending from the movie in the book <laughs> when, as part of the flashback. <laughs> it's a silly bit. Um, Author magic. <laughs> but, yeah, no, but no, we, we, it, is, it is better when everything is all consistent with each other. It's not always possible. It's, you know, we do the best we can. Sometimes it contradicts. I don't stress about what's real in a fictional construct. So, you know, uh, 
it, yeah. it, we do the best we can. And as long as the story works, then we're good. I, f- but, I feel like uh, a lot of like books or, or novelizations of films are, are very different from the actual movie anyway, because they are based on earlier scripts or scripts that often yeah, didn't get the yeah. change. And then some people prefer the books. So, you know, it's not a complete loss. And you can also add things. I mean, uh, you have to. Uh, a movie mm. script is really only about a short story's worth of, some, of story, so you have to add stuff to make a novel out of it. Um, sometimes that's easy. Um, like I said, with Extinction, I had the other stuff to add on. I novelized Serenity back in 2005, and I had 14 hours of the Firefly TV show as backstory to use uh, to help flesh out the book as well. So That's great. <laughs> have you worked on all of the sort of like um... – uh, like IPs or, or things that interest you so far, like r- written for everything that your your heart truly desires. Not all of them. But, <laughs> but, you have a list. Of them uh, but I've written. I mean, it's. I'm particularly pleased that I've gotten to write in ones that I'm a big fan of. I mean, I was. I I grew up watching Star Trek. Um, I have literally been watching Star Trek since birth. So um, that that was being being as involved in writing Star Trek fiction as I was for a good decade there was was a huge thrill and and I and I'm still writing about it for tour.com um and I've what's, got some other what's your favorite series in in Star Trek or the Star Trek universe now uh my favorite is is Deep Space Nine um with 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 the caveat that I absolutely adore the original series and the next generation also um and uh, and I and I enjoy. I'm, I'm actually rewatching Voyager right now, and, appre- and I'm appreciating it more now, 25 years later than I did at the time. Uh, I still don't enjoy it as much as I do the other three. Um, not a, not the biggest fan of Enterprise. I'm enjoying Discovery and Picard, um, but uh, but Deep Space Nine really holds the 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 fondest place in my heart. <laughs> I've I've watched so many of them and. I, I didn't really grow up watching them, but I like one of my friends was really into it. He lent mm-hmm. me his whole like DVD collection and we just played it nonstop. And I can't differentiate between any of the shows now because it's all kind of like jumbled up in my mind. One big jumble. <laughs> but I do like the-, the new stuff, a Discovery and Picard. Um yeah. I think I think Enterprise was my favorite actually. I don't know why, because I found I found the captain really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, do you it's have funny, a... actually? Enterprise is really the only role of Scott Bakula's where I haven't liked him. I I didn't. Yeah. I didn't like, the character like at all. why is he I, such I a jerk? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm loving him now. He's on NCIS New Orleans, and I'm I'm liking him there. And I, you know, Quantum Leap was one of my favorite shows. Uh, yes. Oh Hollywood. my god. Me too. <laughs> I watched that religiously every time. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but no, I've I've most I've written I've gotten to write in a lot of things I am a fan of the the besides Star Trek I've written a couple of Doctor Who short stories which was a huge thrill for me. Um, I've written a lot of Farscape of which I was not only a huge fan but I also got to do a lot of of a lot of of work on uh, both one novel three short stories and then we did a comic book that actually continued the show from where it left off. So we basically did season five of Farscape in comic book form. And I got to work with Rock Neil Bannon, who created the show, uh, on those oh, comic wow. books, which, which was, that was one of my favorite projects I've ever worked on um, in my career, was, was getting to do that. Um, and so, yeah, the, I mean, there's, there's plenty of things that I'm a fan of that I have not written in. Um, it's, there's so much stuff out there, you know, um, and so many things I'm finding uh, you know, there's, there's stuff I haven't even seen yet that, that I haven't gotten around to. I still haven't. We're, we're living in a golden age of, of, of television generally because there's so much good stuff out there. Um, it's hard to keep track of it all. And there's stuff I still haven't caught up on. Um, yeah, same. At, at one point I was subscribed to everything like Netflix, Stan, Amazon. Um, we, we don't have, oh, we had Disney Plus for a while, but it's just it's just so so much and then like yeah. then there's all the anime that i haven't caught up on all of my anime <laughs> friends are like you gotta watch this you gotta watch this and i, I still haven't watched it. <laughs> i'm still playing um reruns of alien <laughs> i stick to what i like yeah 
Uh, what? But, but no, I've been fortunate in that I've gotten to write in a lot of things that I was already a fan of in the first place. I was a fan of Supernatural uh, when they hired me to do that gig. Um, Sleepy Hollow, same thing. Um, and in some cases, I've actually become a fan of it. I, uh, I wrote, the, I wrote a, the first novel based on Gene Roddenberry's Andromeda uh, back in 2003. Oh. Um, the Kevin Sorbo show. Um, I had not, well, I, I caught like maybe one or two episodes and then I got, I got the, the editor uh, at Tor Books who was in charge of that had read my Farscape book and thought, well, if you did, you know, you did a good job with Farscape, would you like to do an Andromeda book? And I said the same thing. Anytime an editor calls me and says, you want to write a book for money? I say, yes. <laughs> and then I figure out how late. Um, and so then I sat down and like, I hadn't really gotten into the show. So I sat down and I immersed myself in the show and became a fan of it. Um, and I actually made some good friendships on that because the, the, a couple of members of the writing staff, uh, Robert Hewitt Wolf, who developed the show, and uh, Ashley Edward Miller and Zach Stentz uh, and Ethelian Vare, who are all writers on the show, were good at making themselves available online. They would like chat with fans and such. And uh, Ash and Zach actually became friends. Um, so uh, that was, that was kind of nifty. That's really uh, fantastic to be able to have that sort of resource. And I guess these days with like the age of the internet and stuff like that, it's made it a lot easier yeah. to like contact people. Yeah. Plus, plus you've also got now, and, and this has been a boon for, for writing tie-ins. And, and this relates to what I was saying before about how some, you know, where the showrunners are getting involved more. You, the people making TV shows and movies right now grew up reading tie-in fiction, you know? Yeah. Um, they, and they grew up reading comic books and they grew up re re reading science fiction. So they, they're they more genuinely interested in what we're doing, which which is great. You know, it, it makes it makes for better stuff. You know, the, the Heroes Reborn novella I did was one of the best working experiences I ever had on a tie-in because they were really invested in making sure that everything tied together and that everything was consistent with each other and that, that this was part of the ongoing story. Yeah. Um, which was great. Yeah. What was the most like difficult thing that you've ever had to write, whether it be a book or a review, or <laughs> was anything like really just absolutely painful? Um, <laughs> you had to put it down and go. You know what? I'll finish this another time. <laughs> I, I there was there have been a couple, uh, two in particular, which I couldn't unfortunately just put down to do another time because I was on deadline. Um, back in uh, 2010, tw 2009, 2010 or so. Um, I signed a contract to write two uh, executioner novels, two Mac Bolan novels based on, on Don Pendleton's uh, character. These are men's adventure stories, which are basically gun porn. <laughs> this is not a genre I am particularly comfortable writing and having done it, I really was in no great rush to do it again. Um, it, was, it was really, it's not my preferred genre of, to write in. Um, and it was really difficult to do. Um, it just, it was, I, 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 I did not have a good time writing those. Uh, I'm happy with how they turned out in the end, but, um, it just, it was incredibly difficult and, uh, I just, it was very frustrating. Um, the, uh, also I, I wrote, um, a role-playing game adventure for the Firefly role-playing game. Oh, okay. Um, they did a, a supplement called Things Don't Go Smooth. And I wrote um, I wrote a, a game module. And that that was that was difficult because the parts that interest me most are the things you can't do in, in an RPG. <laughs> uh, it's, it, I love writing dialogue. I love writing conversations between people. Um, and that's the one thing you can't do. RPGs are entirely about plot mechanics because the characterization stuff gets filled in by the players as they're playing the game. So, um, and the plot mechanics are, are, and you have to come up with every single possibility of what happened. It's incredible. I have, I mean, I always respected game writers before, but after I actually wrote a game, I had a whole lot more respect for game writers because <laughs> I, I, it just doesn't come that easily to me. Yeah. And, um, and it was really difficult. Um, and, and the sad thing is I might be doing it again for a different RPG in the future. Oh, no. Um, but uh, well, I've, already, I've already pitched the basics of it. And, and I'm hoping I don't have to, you know, that I can get some help on, on fleshing it all out. We'll see. Um, but uh, uh, 
that that those were both incredibly difficult. Um, mostly, this stuff comes fairly easily to me. I've been doing this for I've been writing professionally for thirty years. Um, I like to think I'm decent at it at this point. Um, you know, every once in a while, I'm challenged in a in a in a genre I've never worked in before, but I, I'm usually okay with it. So, yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, it's good that like you you love what you do because it would suck that you know like you, you have a talent and then you do the work and then you're like I really don't like this. I like this as a creative outlet, not as a full time job. So it's really good that you feel comfortable doing it. <laughs> a lot more comfortable doing it as a, as a job because then, you know, there's reward at the end of it. But yeah, <laughs> that's true. Rewards, really, because there's, uh, there, there's the money, obviously, but there's also, and I, and I always tell um, people who are early in their careers this, um, I still get the same thrill when the package comes in the mail with a copy of a book I wrote in it that I got back in the 1990s when I first started. Um, it's still like like when when a year ago when when I got my hot off the presses copy of Italy in isolation I was still going yeah, like a kid on Christmas, um, <laughs> because look I made a book I made a book. Um, it's it's wonderful. That's that's that feeling and knowing that the book's out there and that people are buying the book and people are reading the book uh, is is wonderful. And and you know I love the feedback, even even the negative feedback that you get in places like on Amazon and on Goodreads. And, and in you know, book oh, reviews don't and read the book but... reviews. <laughs> I, I, I don't I, mind. I write I write reviews as part of what I do. That's how I started. I started out writing book reviews for Library Journal, for Publishers Weekly, um, for the Comics Journal. Have you um, thought of I like write reviews now? I review <laughs> TV shows and movies on my Patreon and for Tor.com. So if people if people don't, and I, and I know not everyone's going to like my work. I have no problem with people disliking my work, and I have no problem with people writing negative reviews as long as they're not stupid negative reviews. Like, you know. Uh, like I was going to say, are you going to, like, start marking people's reviews? It's like, you did this wrong, you could have elaborated here. And <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, as long as people have a, a lot, give a good reason for why they didn't like something, that's fine. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not going to please everybody. Um you know the 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 reviews that that you know like like one person I, I people who you know just don't as long like I said as long as they have a good reason for why they don't like it I don't mind yeah uh, it, it, as long as you know they gave it a shot um, and and some of the negative reviews are hilarious my favorite review of anything I've written was a spectacularly negative review of my World of Warcraft novel Cycle of Hatred which was a lengthy diatribe about everything I did wrong in the book, ending with, this book sucks and I'm embarrassed to own it. <laughs> and uh, that is my favorite review. I love that review. Keeps me humble. Um, um, so, and also the joke's on him because he owns it. I've already got his money. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I did not know that you wrote a World of Warcraft yes. tie-in book. I wrote, I wrote a, a one. Uh, it was called Cycle of Hatred. It came out in 2006. It was actually the first novel to have the World of Warcraft as opposed to Warcraft logo uh, on the cover. It was right, ah. right after they had switched um, to that. Um, and um, it was actually, it, it bridged the gap between Warcraft 3 and Warcraft 3X and World of Warcraft. It takes place in the gap between those two. And, um, and it was a lot of fun. I, and it, it, it's, it is inarguably my most financially successful book I have had, um that book is in like it's uh i mean the, the the print book alone is in like it's 14th printing or something wow um, and, that is and big. you know it's still available as an ebook and um i still get a royalty i don't get much of a royalty check anymore i used to for for about 10 to 12 years i was getting a huge royalty check every six months on that book um, wow. that, that, that book was tremendously successful. So I, you know, I care even less about the negative review, <laughs> <laughs> but that's the best revenge, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also did a Starcraft novel and then a, uh, a Starcraft manga as well, um, called Ghost Academy, but, um, they were fun to do, uh, a little, that, that, that's a case where, uh, particularly with World of Warcraft, where the people who own it are very 
careful with the tie-ins. I, in a good way, I have never been more micromanaged than I was on that World of Warcraft novel <laughs> because they have that lore down within an inch of its life. Yeah, so they, they would were, have they to. Were, they were going over everything, um, which was good. I mean, you know, that uh, it, it it kept me kept me you know in bounds, as it were. Mm. Um, and and I still got to write the story I wanted to write, which was the important part. So yeah, definitely. Um, did you do much research um, before you started writing the story uh, for bug hunts? Because it feels very like like I said, you're really good at painting like the everyday picture and making it mm. feel like you're very really in that world. And like when you were like describing them shooting at the shooting range, I could actually feel myself there. Um, it was it was a weird sensation because like I don't usually get like that with books that often. And I was like, wow, like I just I had, I had an obsession with it for a while where I had to just every time I read Bug Hunt, I had to start with that first because it kind of led in oh. with the whole um, like Waylon Yutani is in on making these people expendable. They're in on the whole lot. Whereas in the films, it's like maybe, maybe not, and they kind of double down on it with the prequels, but some people don't recognize those. So, like, it, they, they only think about Alien and Special Order 937. So how did you how did you come up with that sort of story to, to, to kind of go from the point of view of a reporter trying to, like, blow everything over? There, there, are, there are two types of characters that I keep gravitating toward as a writer. Uh, one is cops. <laughs> and I, I am, I've written a lot of police procedurals, often in fantastical settings in my, uh, in my work. Uh, I love writing cops, particularly detectives, and I like writing journalists. Um, I've, I've written a lot of different works where journalists are the protagonists, including um, uh, Deep Background. Um, and and I, I those those are just two professions that that I enjoy writing about and and who I think make for good both main characters and supporting characters in fiction um, for for a variety of reasons. Cops mainly because you know they're they're you know when you're dealing with conflict and you're dealing with laws being broken and 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 when you're dealing with trying to find out why a bad thing happened, you know they're useful characters to use for that. And mm -hmm. and same thing with with reporters because they're they're trying to find out things that people don't necessarily want to find out. Um, and that makes for a good character to use in, in a work of dramatic fiction. So, um, uh, and I thought that, you know, there's a long history of reporters being embedded with military units. And, um, and I thought that would be, you know, because the, the, the remit for Bug Hunt was colonial Marine stories. That's what, you know, when Jonathan Mayberry came to me and said, Hey, want to write an alien story? Um, the main thing was it's going to be, you know, the colonial Marines are going to be the focus of it. So I wanted to, I thought the idea of having, of having it be from the point of view of a reporter who was embedded with a team of Marines was, was a good way to do it. Um, and have her also trying to write an expose on Wayland Yutani, which of course would fail because, because. Yeah. <laughs> because Wayland Yutani. <laughs> and, and yeah. And, and it was funny. Cause like I, I wound up, you know, given the, I actually wanted to do more with this reporter and the Marines, and I can't really, but because um, <laughs> I wound up really liking the characters. Right? Yeah, you you did a full rogue one on them, so yeah, and it was fun. I you know I was trying to go for this a similar feel to what Aliens did, and one of the things I love about Aliens is that it put a face on the grunts. Mm. You know, um, it it. They weren't just, you know, a bunch of faceless guys who shoot people a lot. They were they were people with personalities and friendships and conflicts and stuff. Uh, and it really that that's the sort of thing I prefer. I, I I like characters who are people as opposed to, you know, just cannon fodder, you know? Yeah. So you know, even it's, even the ones really good. Person, yeah. I feel like you'd be really good at like a detective story, just because like the the way Deep Background was written. <laughs> I have you... written quite. A, I've got an entire series of uh, police procedurals in a fantasy setting. The first book is called Dragon Precinct, uh, and it's in 
it's in an epic fantasy setting that's right out of your average D and D game or out of Tolkien or, or George R. R. Martin or, or something like that, uh, with humans and elves and dwarves and wizards and magic and stuff like that. But the main characters are detectives who solve crimes. Ah, oh, I'm gonna have to give it a go. <laughs> I have, I have. Uh, it's, it's, it's the the biggest of all, all my original work. It's the one that I've done the most in. There's five novels so far. Um, uh, I'm working on the sixth novel right now, and there's a bunch of short stories as well. So, what I usually do is I would buy um, a, a work of yours before reading um, Alien Isolation, but because I had already read D- Deep Background, I didn't go and get a book because that's what I usually do. I do a bit more research, just, I kind of see your writing style, and if there's any like uh, uh, repeated like patterns or like mannerisms that certain characters have and I, I kind of like you know get really deep into that world um and kind of get into your head you know about how you write your characters um but because you wrote deep background I was like oh, you know I know what's gonna happen and I already played Alien Isolations you know but now you tell me about Dragon Precincts I'm definitely gonna have to go by that now excellent oh geez how old is that one by the way uh, Dragon Precinct first came out in 2004 um, as a mass market paperback, and then the imprint that it was part of was discontinued. So the series was kind of left flapping in the breeze. In 2011, it was picked up by a small press uh, out of New Jersey called Dark Quest Books, uh, and then they also so they did. I was able to get the rights back on Dragon Precinct, and then we did. Uh, the subsequent books, Unicorn Precinct, Goblin Precinct, Griffin Precinct, and then Dark Quest kind of fell into the swamp, and now Eastbeck Books picked it up. They reprinted all of them, uh, and they're the ones who it's available from now. So, okay. um, so there's, they published Mermaid Precinct, which is the most recent. Uh, they, re- they put out new editions of the first uh, four books and also a short story collection, Tales from Dragon Precinct. And then I've got a contract with them to do two more novels and another short story collection. Wow. Jeez. I've got so much reading to do. So thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, and as it happens, because, because um, eSpec Books, if, if, if you prefer uh, eBooks, um, eSpec Books is all of their eBooks are currently available for uh, 99 cents American, $1. So, oh, well, that's good then. <laughs> I'll definitely I, I, get them then. I'm, I'm not sure how that sale translates into international sales. I don't know one way or the other. Uh, yeah. I think for Australia, oh, okay. it'll be like three bucks per book, but yeah. that's that's fine. I'm used to paying like about $40 a book, unfortunately. Oof. Yeah, I so, know. It's an expensive hobby here, at yes. least. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, but the, um, and, and I actually just finished a story in that universe. Uh, and then I got to get soon to work on that and another urban fantasy I'm working on. So. Wow. That's a lot. Busy, busy. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have um any any anything in the works that will be coming out um in the next few months? Uh I have two collaborative books. Um uh one is uh will be out actually fairly soon. In fact, by the time uh, soon. Anyway. Um also from East Spec Books, there's a, a military science fiction trilogy. So if you're a fan of of the alien movies, this this might be of interest. Uh, it's called The 18th Race. It's by David Sherman. Uh, the first two books are called um, Issue in Doubt and In All Directions. The third book is called To Hell and Regroup, and I wrote it with David. Uh, I edited the first two books um, when they were first published. I was, I was the editor on those. For various uh, personal and health reasons, David was unable to finish the third book. He'd, he'd written parts of it. He he'd, he'd, you know, had story notes and, and all the rest of it. But um, he just wasn't able to finish it. And he asked me because he was he enjoyed working with me on the first two. He asked me to basically collaborate with him to finish it. So uh. Uh, so that's the, the book is as much is real. It's really a David Sherman book that I just helped him finish. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but that'll be out soon. Um, and uh, it's called To Hell and Regroup. The and then at the end of the year, uh, I've got a thriller coming out, which is much different from usual. Also a collaboration with. A uh, doctor out in California, excuse me, named Munish K. Batra. Munish and I uh, work together on this. It's a book about a serial killer. Oh, okay. Uh, specifically, a serial killer who targets people who harm animals. Ooh. And uh, the book it's is called. It's kind of like Animal. Dexter, then, but yeah, yeah. after animals. Uh, 
Dexter, Adam. if he was a member of PETA. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, that, that'll be out around the end of the year. Um, and, um, and I've also got a couple of short stories coming out soon, um, uh, both from Crazy 8 Press. Uh, one is called uh, Pangea 3, which is the third of a shared world anthology that Michael Jan Friedman created. Uh, and I wrote a story for that. Uh, also, by the, another one about a, a reporter. It's about a journalist. Uh, <laughs> I said the pattern here. here. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I told you. Um, and then uh, there's a, an anthology Mary Fan edited called Badass Moms. And which is about, as you can imagine, moms who are badass. And um, uh, my story there is, uh, it's called Macho Familias. It's about, um, it takes place in the same universe as my urban fantasy series. Uh, but it, it's about a woman who is a supernatural hunter for hire. Uh, and her, her two teenage daughters uh, help her out on her hunts. So, Wow, that sounds cool. Yeah. And I'm currently working and I'm hoping to get it out uh, also around the end of this year. Um, the second book in my in the same urban fantasy series as that I mentioned, it takes place uh, here in New York City. Um, the first book was called A Furnace Sealed, and it came out uh, last year from Word Fire Press. It's about a guy named Brom Gold, who is also again a supernatural hunter for hire. Um, and uh, I'm working on the second book right now called Feet of Clay. Um, so that's that's my next big project, uh, and and I'm hoping to get that out by the end of this year, the top of next year. Least, yeah. So. Wow. And then, and then, and then I've got the next precinct book as well. So that, <laughs> that's gotta be fun. And Munich and I are working on a second book together, um, which I've got to do another draft of. Um, I've finished the first draft. I need to, it, it needs some revision. And, uh, and we, and we probably are going to want to do a sequel to animal down the line as well. Oh, so. wow. Lots Jeez. of stuff. In opera. So much. I can't imagine writing that much. <laughs> I struggle to even keep my blog up. Plus, today. I still got you know I, I I've got the stuff for tour dot com and for my Patreon, um, which is which is mostly nonfiction. Um, for tour dot com, I'm I'm currently doing uh, the Star Trek Voyager rewatch. Uh, I've already done rewatches of the original Star Trek of the Next Generation of Deep Space Nine. Uh, I am also currently reviewing each new episode of Discovery, Short Treks, and Picard as they come out. Mm -hmm. Um. And uh, now I'm rewatching Voyager. I will probably rewatch Enterprise when I'm done with that because that would be the only one I haven't covered. So I may as well be complete about it. But right now I'm uh, I'm just I'm just at the end of the second season uh, of Voyager, so I still got plenty to go. Wow. Um, and I also write uh, I write about other things for tour periodically. I did from 2017 to the beginning of this year. Uh, I did uh, the great superhero movie rewatch, which covered every single live action movie based on a superhero film. Oh my God, um, that it would be a lot, it, especially with all the Marvel films. Exactly. Yeah. No, it took me. I mean, I started. I started with um, Superman and the Mole Men from 1953, uh, and the 1966 Batman, and worked my way forward all the way up to uh, in January of this year. I finally made it up to Joker, and then I caught up to real time. Um, I'm doing, I'm, I'm going to be reviving the feature periodically with new batches of stuff that come out. Um, so. Uh, yeah. Cause they've got one division coming out and they've also got. The well, that's new... a TV show. I'm, I'm specifically. I'm oh, specifically only doing movies? There's movies in this. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. Cause I was going to say but... TV shows. There's a lot of stuff as well. Oh yeah. 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 No, no. I, I, I don't have that kind of time. But. <laughs> The uh, no, I'm just doing. You know, I said just live action movies based on superhero comic books, which still gives me plenty. I mean, I there's over a, well over a hundred films uh, that I did. Um, did you do Dick and, Tracy? Because he's not technically yes. not a superhero. I, yeah, I, I I blurred the lines occasionally. I did do. In fact, not only did I do the Warren Beatty Dick Tracy, when I was doing that one, doing the research for that, I discovered that there were four Dick Tracy theatrical films that were done in the 1940s. Um, you can find them on YouTube, actually, um, and uh, so I so I covered those as well. Basically, if it was uh, the definition of superhero, I had to you know be a little flexible with it. But basically, so, if it's if, if it was based on a comic book and is an action adventure story about people trying to you know help other people, mm. then 
I yeah. counted. So I counted Fla like Flash Gordon. I counted. Um, Rocketeer. I did Tracy. I did Flash Gordon. I did Sin City. Um, I did uh, Modesty Blaze. Oh um, wow, cool. And a few other things that that are kind of borderline. But, um, I, I own I Flux. The, I'm sorry. I own Flux. I did not do a on Flux, but I don't think that was a just... comic book, was it? Uh, it was, oh, no, yes and no. I think it was an animated series and then they made it a comic yeah. and then they made it a movie. Yeah. So yeah, technically not. Yeah I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm only doing things that started out life as a comic book. So I'm not including like, for example, The Shadow, which started out as a uh, pulp short stories mm. uh, and as a radio show. Um, I'm not doing Buck Rogers because that actually started out as a short story that was adapted into a comic book. So, um, so yeah, that, that, it, it it has to the source material has to be a comic book. Yeah, it's still a hell of a catalog though. That's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. And so I just so in in June of 2020, I've been re I revived the feature long enough to cover Bloodshot and uh, Birds of Prey, and then I also there was one. It turns out there was one movie I missed. Uh, back in 2000, they released a movie based on uh, Faust, uh, the comic book, and oh. so I'm going to cover that. Uh, as well, and then at the end of the year, uh, assuming you know, there's a whole bunch that that are supposed that were supposed to have been released already that haven't been. Um, but we've got you know, we've got the King's Man, we've got Wonder Woman 1984, we've got Black Widow, um, and uh, New Mutants, uh, Morbius. All are supposed to be coming out this year, whether they do or not. I don't know. Whatever ones do actually come out between now and December, I'm going to cover them at the end. Of the year. Well, so you, gonna, know, you know, it'll come out on streaming. Or, so. Maybe you might have to be lax yeah. with your rules a little bit. Well, I mean, I basically, every, like I said, every six months to a year or so, I'm going to revive the feature long enough to cover what's been out since then, whatever comes out. Yeah. Um, you know, so if it if it's released, then I'll cover it. If it's not, I won't. Uh, now you've made so. me think about Dick Tracy being like a poor version of Batman. <laughs> He's got all the gadgets and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Would Inspector Gadget count? <laughs> <laughs> he started now that started out as a as a, an animated series so. yeah that's true i mean what that's if he true. started out as a comic it, 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 it depends on the source material yeah but um but anyway so i'm right I, I, i've got that for the, the voyager rewatch is twice a week on tour so mm. um and also for my patreon i write tv reviews movie reviews uh, and also I've been writing little vignettes featuring my original characters besides the precinct books and the, um, uh, the urban fantasy. Those are two of the, those are two of my original series that are going on and probably the most, well, um, I've also got another urban fantasy series, which I've, um, it's only been short stories thus far. I haven't done any novels with it, but they're, they're based in Key West, Florida. Oh, um, about a young woman named Cassie Zukov, who's a bit of a weirdness magnet who encounters crazy ass stuff that happens in Key West. And uh, so there's her. I've also got the Super City Cops, which is uh, also about cops, but in a city filled with superheroes and the kind of nonsense that they have to deal with <laughs> on a regular <laughs> basis. Um, I've written one novel, two short stories, and three novellas in that universe. And I've got four more novellas under contract, which I also have to write at some point. Um, and uh, that. Uh, in addition to all the other things I have to write. Yeah. Um, but the, the vignettes that I've been doing on Patreon have featured those characters. Um, and it's and just, just little short little scenes. It's just fun little stuff in the universe. Um, uh, you know, nothing that requires a whole story, but just little little bits and pieces with the characters and such. So To you, is that still canon to the other books? Like, would you oh, yeah. kind of refer yeah. to a scene, but then yep. people not really know about it? And you're like, if you want to read well, more... <laughs> <laughs> it's been more the other way around. It, it like like as an example, um, in Goblin Precinct, the third book in the Precinct series, there's I introduce uh, a female wizard, uh, and the official position of the Brotherhood of Wizards is that women can't do magic. This is nonsense, of course, but um, but the Brotherhood of Wizards are a bunch of hidebound old idiots, um, and. Uh, so she basically taught herself magic because she couldn't get any help from the Brotherhood. Um, so one of the vignettes I did was just, I mentioned that she had tried to get the attention of the local 
representative of the Brotherhood to, to uh, apprentice to him, and he kept refusing her. So I dramatize that. The vignette is basically her attempts to get the Brotherhood's attention. Um, so it's just, just a little extra, you know, background stuff that was, you know, fleshing out something that, that was already mentioned. Oh, um, yeah. Just to sort of get into that character's head a little bit. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not making the vignettes like incredibly important stuff. It's just little side pieces. Yeah. Oh, I still like those. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And, awesome. and that's the, there's, there's a bunch of different things on the Patreon for, if you just do $1 a month, all you get are the movie reviews. Uh, $2 a month. You also get cat pictures. I have very photogenic cats. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and then $5 a month. You also get the TV reviews. $7 a month, you get excerpts from my current work in progress, whatever that might be. Um, $10 a month gets you the vignettes. And then for $20 a month, you get first a first look at my first drafts. Whenever I finish a chapter or a short story, you get to see the first draft. Mm. So wow. So the, the most expensive tier is, only, is still only 20 bucks a month. Um, <laughs> and and for that 20 bucks a month, you get all that stuff. So <laughs> you get TV show, TV reviews, movie reviews, cat pictures, vignettes, and excerpts. Wow. And the first dress. So um, That's I, a lot. I try I try to give I try to give good value for not a lot of money. So. <laughs> That's good though. Yeah. Um is there anything that I'm I'm missing doing while in pandemic isolation and lockdown so far? Like you said like going out for food, but is there anything else that you would like what would be the first thing that you'd want to do when you go out? Uh, when it's safe is just see people. I miss people. <laughs> um, You're a people person? Very much so. Yes. This is, this is hell for an extrovert. Um, I, I, I miss going to conventions. I miss, you know, go, I live down the street from my parents and I can't really see them for more than two seconds at a time. And from a distance of six feet, you know, uh, I, I, I miss that just general interaction uh, and just hanging out with people and seeing people. You know, um, doing it over over Zoom or over Skype or over Discord is okay up to a point, but um, and it certainly beats not interacting with anybody at all. But there's just so many people I just want to be able to like hug, you know, yeah. or, or or you know, interact with directly or or just you know, yeah. That's the main thing is just being able to be with be around people again. Yeah. Uh, what have you been doing in your spare time? Like, I guess it's the same as you always do because you work from home. I don't have a hell of a lot of spare time, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised with all of the writing you've been talking about. Um, I, I, I still, I'm, we're still doing martial arts. The, the dojo has been doing classes over zoom. So, uh, so I take class in my living room. Um, and uh and that have, that's, have there been any that. accidents i'm sorry has there been any accidents doing doing a martial arts <laughs> <You're not sure. laughs> i have to be very careful not to kick that tv I, yeah i was gonna say like you you seem like a very tall guy just from the photos i'm not no i'm only five eight um, <laughs> I'm not that um but uh the uh i'm still doing that um, I've been watching a hell of a lot of TV, although I'm monetizing that because I'm also reviewing it for Patreon. Um, you know, there's a bunch of, of TV and, and we've actually, we've been, because we're not going out to eat anymore, there's a bunch of things that we never tried cooking that we have been cooking. Like, um, I'd never cooked veal parmesan, even though I love veal parmesan. Um, we've been doing that. Um, we've been trying some different things and different recipes and such. Um, I mean, we always cook anyway, but there's, uh, we've been, we have been doing things we hadn't done before or haven't done a lot of, which has been fun. Um, and, uh, and also, um, we, uh, me and several friends of ours, uh, have a monthly poker game. Oh, okay. Um, that has turned into a weekly poker game that we do over Zoom, um, <laughs> which has been great. I haven't been able to do it every single time, but, uh. But it's been it's been fun. There's there's a, a website, an interactive website where you can uh, called playingcards.io, um, where where people can all like you can have a deck of cards and people can manipulate it and stuff, and you can play poker. Pretty much any card game you can do over over that site. Um, 
you know you can set up you know you can set up your own room in it uh and we've been we've been doing that um and it's been great um and that's been that's been good just you know for and and we've been you know as a group of friends who get together every week over zoom just to talk to each other just to do that and it's just it's helped you know yeah these things a little bit you have know, you I mean, been able like, to um to vis- visualize people's tells like since it's not in person <laughs> The poker games we do are not that. Um, not serious. <laughs> it, 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 it's a social function more than it is trying to actually be good at poker. Um, the, <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're we're we do a lots of lots of silly wild card variants and stuff like that, and it's it's, it's mostly just to have fun with our friends. We're not. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I feel like and my cousins that- are like super serious when it comes to poker, especially around New Year's. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. We don't. We don't get that aggressive about it. Um, I mean, we try to you know, guess up to a degree, but it's and and it's a lot harder to to, to figure out you know those kinds of tells when you're um, when it's a little tiny box on your screen, you know, mm. um, as opposed to person sitting next to you. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, has anything really surprised you um, that in the past three months that you you didn't expect from everything that's going on? Uh, um, uh, not really. Um, I uh, people's resiliency certainly and flexibility. The fact that one of the things that always bugs me is is when people use say, well, people don't want to change their habits. People change their habits all the time. Um, I, I, you know, when I first started working uh, in an office after I graduated, I graduated college in 1990 uh, and started working in an office. At the time, you could smoke indoors. <laughs> mm. um, you know, my 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 publisher would smoke a cigar in his office. Um, and that was normal. Uh, people adjusted. Uh, you know, people adjust to different. You know, people. When I was when I was a kid, not everybody always fastened necessarily fastened their seatbelt in the car. Um, by the time I learned how to drive, that had changed. Um, and now everybody does it as a matter of course. Um, you know, people people change what they do all the time, and that particularly became the thing here. People went from interacting with each other normally to then now wearing masks and staying away from each other. And of course not everybody does, but not everybody puts their seatbelt on either. Um, <laughs> Pretty true. The, but the fact that so many people adjusted so quickly to what suddenly became the new normal um, impressed the hell out of me. Um, you know, for all that not everybody did it. Um, it's still... The, the, you know, a large number of people were able to make that adjustment uh, in a remarkably short amount of time. Um, yeah, because it all it all changed really quickly. Um, you know, went from "oh, this might be a problem" to the entire world was locked down in about two weeks. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. Especially like pollution dropping up to seventeen yeah. percent. That was pretty yeah. wow for me because I didn't think anyone could give up driving their car and and working from home and doing all these things that I've been raving about on for years. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. I mean, it, th- thank goodness for technology. Certainly. I mean, I, I, I didn't even, I'd never even heard of zoom before. <laughs> 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 and it's suddenly become the most popular program in the world. Um, so yeah. The, and, and, and I think it's going to, you know, the, the, there was already a slow movement away from working at home being some kind of stigma or some kind of really unusual, difficult thing. And now I think it's going to become way more commonplace mm. um, because we've already proven that it can work. Um, but I think, I think, I think that that's, I mean, not a lot has surprised me really. Um, uh, but, but I've been impressed at least with that, with how, how well many people have been able to adjust, but that's, People are flexible, um, yeah. more flexible than they often give themselves credit for. Mm. And I guess, yeah. like riding in these fantasy worlds and, and fantastical situations, you're kind of doing that exercise in your head anyway, where people have to adapt okay. or to survive. Yep. The uh, 
one of the things I, I do like to write about is the aftermath of a disaster. Um, the disaster itself is of much less interest to me than the recovery from it. Um, and, uh, you know, so that, that, you know, that, that's, that's certainly something I have written about in the past uh, and will probably write about again. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting, the idea of um, uh, someone writing a TV series about an office worker who, who was there during the time of um, all the Avengers movies in New York. It just like, you know, disaster after disaster, having to like clean up the <laughs> office, just having finished a 900 page report and put it on their boss's desk only to have the building blown up. Just things like that. To be like, what the hell? One of my favorite stories that I've written, um, I wrote a story back in 2001, there was an anthology, uh, a Xena warrior princess anthology. <laughs> really? And I didn't I know you were into Xena. That. It's amazing. Yes. Uh, I wrote a story for that called Recurring Character, which was about a guy who everywhere he goes, every, every he's he's a an ex soldier, uh, mercenary type, and everywhere he goes, no matter what he does, he winds up getting beat up by Zena over and over again. <laughs> and like he finally gives up, travels to Rome, works as a prison guard, and gets beat up by Zena. Uh, <laughs> And she never even remembers him from one time to the other. It was partly inspired by the fact that, you know, in, they use the same four stunt, stunt people for all the all the fight scenes, you know. Yeah. So, but... It's uh, fantastic. <laughs> oh, my God. Sorry. It's really entertaining. I've got to I've gotta uh, read that one as well. It was... It, it, I, I assume... I don't know if it's how available it is at this point. Um, I don't know, because it was... Because it came out in 2001, so it may or may not be available as an ebook. Because that was, yeah. you know, ebooks were, were, were not, were still not entirely a thing yet. I mean, they existed uh, back into the late 90s, but, um, uh, and Simon and Schuster, at least, was on the ebook bandwagon fairly early uh, around 1999, 2000. But I don't, but that wasn't Simon and Schuster, it was Ace Books. And I don't know if they did an ebook version of it or not. Uh, I'm going to um, have to track it down. I'll find yeah, a way. Uh, I do intend, that's one I intend to read. I, I, one of the other things I've been doing, you asked what I was doing in my spare time, um, and I forgot to mention this. I'm, I started a series on YouTube, a YouTube channel called Cred COVID Readings. Cred being my initials, COVID being, you know, disease, uh, and readings of my short fiction. I have been reading various short stories that I've written over the years. Um, my original stuff, uh, including, the, I've written a ton of Dragon Precinct short stories, a lot of the uh, Key West-based Cassie Zukov short stories. Plus, I've read a lot of my tie-in works, um, Star Trek stories. Uh, I've wrote an X-Files story. Um, I've written some Super City Cop stories of my own thing. Um, and and I wrote a Zorro short story a bunch of years ago. Um, actually, the Zorro short story is one of my favorite stories that I've written. Um wrote a battle tech story that's going to go live this week. Um, Ooh. just a whole, I've, I've written close to a hundred short stories. So I've got plenty <laughs> of material to work from. Um, and, uh, and I've been reading them and I, I actually intend to read bug hunt, uh, that bug hunt, uh, deep background, my story in bug hunt. Uh, yeah. that's going to be coming up, uh, on, on the reading series in the next week or two. Uh, and I also want to do the Xena story soon as well. Cause that was, that was a fun one. Oh, wow. So, uh, that, that is a, a, a place where you can check out my work without having to actually pay for it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I, I, I understand that not everybody has a lot, you know, there's a lot of people who are out of work and there are a lot of people who are, you know, hoarding money just in case um, because they don't know if they're going to stay in work. And, you know, there's a lot of people who are not necessarily spending money on entertainment right now. Um, or if they are, they're spending it on things for their kids or for their spouses or, or for, you know, Mm. Your 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 Zoom, you know, if you need a, the 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 advanced version of Zoom for work, you know, whatever. Um, so, the and it's just something just to provide some entertainment for people who are stuck at home. So, well, it's very much appreciated. I'm I'm looking forward to you reading um, Deep Background. That would be great. <laughs> Have you um, listened to the audio book version of of of, 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 of deep background or of um, alien Actually, isolation. I, I, I haven't listened to either of them. I own them both. I just haven't. I, I'm not a big audio person. Um, I, it's just not. I, 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 I don't like to consume my fiction that way. It's just a personal thing. 
Um, I don't go on long drives because uh, I work from home. So mm-hmm. the, like the, the places where I have consumed audiobooks most, where I've enjoyed them, have been in cases where I'm driving a long distance. Uh, um, which I don't, I, I do it like when I go to conventions and stuff, but usually it's me and my wife and we're talking. So, <laughs> um, so uh, I don't do a lot of long drives alone. Uh, so for that reason, um, I don't, I don't do audiobooks as often. Uh, I would like to listen to them at some point. I'm trying to remember if I listen. I may have listened to Deep Background, but I have no memory of it now. Yeah. Um, uh, the, I know I, there's other, I've listened to a bunch of my short stories, uh, other short stories that have been done in audio because it's not as much of a commitment, you know? Um, yeah. but, uh, I do, I can say in terms of audio, I, I haven't listened. I did listen to the audio of A Furnace Sealed because that was, um, I had approval over that. So that was my yeah. urban fantasy. It was read, it was read by a guy named TJ Clark who did such a good job. It was an amazingly good job. He, he absolutely nailed it. It was it was brilliant. Um, but no, I haven't I haven't listened to either Isolation or Deep Background yet. I'm, I'm I hope they're good. <laughs> <laughs> they're good. <laughs> At least from my point of view, I thought I thought they were pretty good. good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me and 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 you know flapping gums for about an hour and thirty minutes now. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> it's okay. been a long time. Wow. But, okay. Not, but it's so much quite. fun talking to you. I've um I've seen you online, and um I I apologize for not um talking about alien isolation more in my other podcast, which I tagged you in. Uh, just because I really, I really, really wanted to make sure that my friend uh, Ben had read the book, and he actually has a couple of questions which I have to find. And read out so uh okay you can answer them for him um happy to do it he said uh what was the most challenging scene when it came to translating gameplay into engaging text form hmm um some of the the some of the, the I can't think of any one particular, but some of the the combat scenes were a little difficult to to work on just because the 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 logistics seemed a little awkward. Um, like the and, and some of them were just unnecessarily complicated, which which makes sense in a game because you want to make it complicated to make it hard for the for the player. But in terms of a story, it just it just felt odd that it was like like the bit where where they had to. Uh, reactivate the rail, which involved running around to the other side, and they both had to activate the thing at the same time. And it was just, yeah, uh, <laughs> it, that, that was that was very obviously game mechanics rather than story mechanics, <laughs> which, which is fine. It was you know when you you have different a game has different needs than a work of fiction, so I you know it's not a problem. It's just that was that was a challenge. Um, that was that was a difficult thing to 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 make work. Yeah. Um, and there were a couple of other bits like that that were more of a challenge just because they were they were very obviously designed with making things as difficult as possible for the game player. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I agree. With that that whole scene, it was a bit weird as well. Even playing yeah. it, I'm like, look behind you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> one, of my, one of my favorite, one thing I wanted to mention before I forget. Yeah. Uh, when I first, when I first started telling people that I was doing this uh, and then when I started you know, having it with me at conventions to sell. There were a lot, one of the most common questions I got from people who had played the game was, does Amanda spend the whole game, the, does Amanda spend the whole novel hiding in a closet? Because that's what I did when I played the game. <laughs> well, floating in pitch black is very similar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. A bit more claustrophobic in a suit, though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um... All right, and he also asked, uh, "What went into the decision to put Marlowe's story at the beginning instead of where it takes place in the game?" I, looking at it from a story perspective, I thought Marlowe's uh, little adventure. I thought that worked better as a prologue; that it mm-hmm. set everything up. Um, you know, from from a, from a gameplay perspective, I, I get why it's not till later that filling in the background. But I thought, from a story perspective, it made more sense to use that as the setup for the rest of the book. 
Yeah. Um, that that was my decision. Um, I mean, it was it was completely supported by both my editor Steve Saffel and by the people at 20th Century Fox. Um, I just I just thought it worked better because I wanted to keep. I don't want to interrupt the flow of the story of Amanda's story. Um, Cause after, once we got past that prologue, the rest of the story was entirely from Amanda's point of view, which was very important to me. I wanted the whole book to be in Amanda's head. Um, I know there were some people who were disappointed in that. There were some people who were expecting that the book would flesh out other things that happened on Sevastopol. Um, and and I, I, mean, I tried to do that with the little interstitial bits I did between some of the chapters with like the memoranda and, and the letters and, and reports and stuff like that um to to flesh that out a little bit and i used and i used some stuff from the game and also from the tie-in comic book that the the dark horse did for that um but i i wanted the focus to be on amanda and i didn't want i wanted it to be a solid thing of amanda's pov and i just thought having marlo having having the sudden break in the middle of it where marlo does a flashback would have would not have flowed as well in the novel yeah um so, and it was, I mean, that was, none of that was really spoilery information. I mean, we knew that, you know, <laughs> uh, that they found, we knew from the beginning that they found the, the flight recorder. Um, and it also, you know, sort of set the stage in, in a scene that basically is in, on, on the planet that, that they went to in Alien um, and picking up from that. So it sort of, it firmly set it in the same universe as, in the same setting as yeah. Alien. So yeah. that was part of it. That was part of the decision too. Oh, okay. Cool. That's really good. Thank you so much for answering uh, those questions from Benjamin Scottford. Oh, no problem. Um, and I- you must also know uh, Alicia, who is alien isolation obsessive disorder. She absolutely loves the game and she absolutely loves the book and she wanted me to tell you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alicia. But yeah. Uh, yeah, no, and I, 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 I adore the character of Amanda Ripley. I really enjoyed writing her. Um, and and the, the, the part of the book I enjoyed the most was the backstory. Um, the, the novelizing the game action was, was fun, uh, and I enjoyed that too. But the, the meat of the novel to me is the backstory, partly because it gave me the opportunity to write Ellen Ripley, who's like one of the best characters in all of science fiction uh, movie dumb. Um and and being able to expound on the the entire Ripley family on on her you know Ellen's backstory Amanda's backstory do the 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 scene on the other ship where where uh, Ellen was on uh, where she helped quell a mutiny um, all that stuff was was tremendous fun to write. You know, getting getting to write Ellen Ripley is 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 was a huge thrill, and getting to develop Amanda also was. Um, I, I really love that character. She's, um, and and I want to write more of her. I, I I don't know if I'm going to get to. Um, That's what I was uh, going to ask. Do you think you'd ever want to write another Alien anything ever absolutely. again? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> um, the 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 stumbling blocks right now are are right. Disney bought Fox like right at the end of the process of doing the book. And we were actually worried that like it was going to affect, it didn't. Um, we were worried because we were worried that our, our guy in licensing was going to be one of the people laid off when the merger happened. Uh, but he, he did keep his job. Um, and so everything went through smoothly, but the, the subsequent plans are all kind of up in the air. Uh, plus yeah. there were, yeah, there's other things that, that they're developing besides that. Um, and then, and then the, pandemic slowed everything down also uh all of all of mainstream it's been interesting actually mainstream publishing was severely curtailed by the pandemic because bookstores are closing and or at least you know temporarily closing and and sales are down and and a lot of publishers have had to lay people off for the small press though it hasn't really changed a lot um and and because our margins because the small press margins are so much lower um, they're able to keep going for the most part. I mean, mo- most small presses are people running things out of their house anyway. Um, yeah. and, you think that's been good for them? And, and also, but also small press does, most of them do more sales in ebook than in print form. And people are still buying ebooks at least because they can, you know. Oh yeah, that, that's, that's more, true. Yeah, that's it's true. easier to buy ebooks now than it is print books. So, um, I mean, it still is bad for everybody because, you know, bad economy yeah. means bad publishing. But everything slowed down. So right now 
Um, I have, I have a notion for a sequel to Isolation that would involve not just Amanda but also Zula Hendricks. Um, but this is that's just a thing I want to do. It's not anything beyond that. Um, <laughs> because like they did cancel that that comic that Brian Wood was going to bring out, um, which was uh, going to kind of detail the the story of an, another character that they're introducing mm-hmm. into the Amanda Zula arc, uh, right. who is Olivia Ship. Um, do you, do you think you'd be able to to write a book version? of that where they all kind of like anything's possible. I, uh, <laughs> like I said, I had a basic notion of what to do. Um, but it would involve, um, you know, a lot of work coordinating among myself, uh, Steve Saffel and, uh, and the people at, at Disney. Um, yeah. And I don't Cold, know. Cold I mean, yes, studios as basic. well, because they're, they're, they're writing the game. So that mm-hmm. character is supposed to appear in the game. So you'd have to, no, I'd, you know. <laughs> you know, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah. Whatever, whatever they would want to do. I just want to. I want to write more Zula, and I want to write more Amanda. Um, whether I get to, I don't know. But uh, um, it, it, it's, it's all up in the air. Uh, it's just a, a pie in the sky dream. If I don't, I don't. Uh, but I would love to. Um, um, and I do have basic notion for for a story that I think could work. But um, we'll see. I hope so. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for giving me uh, your uh, time and, and talking to me about all of your amazing writing. I've, I've got so much to catch up on now. Um, and, and everyone, um, make sure you hop along to uh, Keith's channel, which I will pop a link in the video uh, after I finish talking so you guys can uh, go to his um, if, if- Channel if you subscribe. go to my website, if you go to my website at decandido.net, my last name decandido.net, it's not much of a website. It's it's fairly primitive, but it's basically a link dump. So it links you to all my social media, my Facebook page, my Twitter feed, my Instagram account, um, my Wikipedia page, uh, my stuff on tour.com, my YouTube channel, um, and all that stuff. So that's 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 sort of the clear and, and my blog also, which which I update fairly regularly. So if if you go to decandido.net, that's that's the place to find all that stuff. And there's actually ordering information for Alien Isolation on there specifically. So Oh wonderful. That's great. Thank you so much for talking to me. <laughs> my pleasure. I and um it. yeah, I hope I can uh, catch up with you another time, which I guess it will be on your live stream because uh you'll be um reading uh, deep background, my favorite. My favorite short story from the book. (laughs) Yes. Excellent. All right. So this is Mother and Keith signing off.